here, uh, you know, the uh, the international WFM uh, group, uh, you know, and of course, uh, with uh, nice and delicacies, you know, so the, uh, sponsors behind this event. Uh, yeah, so thank you, appreciate uh, I'll spend the next about 10 minutes talking about, uh, you know, uh, what Connect is, but more importantly, what we are trying to do in the, in the customer service space, uh, how, you know, we want to move from customer service to, to customer obsession. Uh, and you know why and what, what we are doing about it. So, uh, I will talk about Connect a little more later in the context specifically about we are doing on customer service. But uh, suffice to say that we are India's largest uh, domestic uh, BPO company with a very, very strong focus on, on the domestic market being in operations for the last 18 years. Uh, had a Tata heritage and lineage, uh, so we were earlier known as Tata Business Support Services, 100% uh, subsidiary of the Tata Group then. Uh, starting 2017, we are now a proud, uh, you know, proud part of the Quest Corp. Quest is Bangalore-based, uh, ultimate uh, holding by Fairfax and Mr. Prem Vatsa, but started by Mr. Ajit Isaac, uh, you know, a leading entrepreneur. And uh, we are now a very integral part of what is known as the, the technology solutions uh, part of, of Quest Corp. Yeah. And uh, we are currently have more than 45,000 people across the country. Uh, 26 delivery locations, uh, serving 150 plus market customers, and as as the compare said, across multiple verticals. Uh, banking and financial services is our largest vertical, but we also have retail and e-commerce as one of our fastest growing verticals. So we've nearly doubled every year in, 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 in e-commerce over the last two years. Uh, other than of course, uh, you know, supporting some of the you know some of the more uh, storied names in auto manufacturing. Uh, media, you know, across, across both Tata and non Tata group companies. Yeah, so with that, I'll just start and just give a bit of a industry context. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is from one of the, uh, the NASCOM, uh, NASCOM studies. Uh, as we know, uh, you know, NASCOM is the association for for IT and IT services organization. So, so BPM as we know it, you know, or, or BPO as we used to call it in the past, has, has evolved, yeah. So, uh, as we all know, it started uh, sometime in the late, uh, late 80s, early 90s, yeah, and uh, started largely with some of the captive organizations of, you know, some of the multinational names who used to work in India, you know, City Group uh, being one of the early movers at that point in time, uh, you know, in, in this space. So, so of course, at that point in time, what you should call BPM one was all about largely cost arbitrage, yeah? cost arbitrage and availability of uh, local talent in India, and you know, and that was as we all know is the genesis of the of the BPO industry. Uh, started largely with the contact center side and also you know FNA as a horizontal, and you know that was one of the early early starts of you know of, of the BPO as we know it, but largely cost arbitrage driven. Yeah. Uh, moving to BPM2, you know, where uh, cost arbitrage started becoming a given, you know, becoming a sort of, uh, you know, a hygiene factor and, you know, that's when I think the entire industry started moving towards, you know, the whole operational excellence piece, yeah. So, how do we start delivering something over and above cost arbitrage, yeah? And that's when, you know, I mean, all the nice things which we do in terms of efficiency, quality, uh, you know, occupancy, you know, efficiency metrics, uh, all, of, all of that started coming about, we sort of started using some of the known tools like Lean and Six Sigma to deliver some of the outcomes there. And of course, you know, the services started getting horizontal, uh, sorry, more horizontal. So HR, you know, which is the sort of employee life cycle, hire to retire, you know, came as one of the additional, uh, additional uh, sort of horizontals we worked with. And of course, you know, more greater move towards verticalization, you know, or verticalization specialization. Yeah. So that so that was BPM two. Then we had something like BPM three, really, you know, which was, you know, which was the tech enablement part of it. Yeah. So I mean, how do we get tech enabled in terms of the services uh, which we deliver? And of course, you know, that brought with it the next wave of, of cost efficiencies, you know, quality improvements, uh, and uh, the services also started becoming more full suite. Uh, you know, I mean, in my one of my earlier organizations. We used to do even insurance, uh, you know, and actual support out of India. You know, I mean, just to give an example, in terms of you know some of the newer age of stuff that we started doing analytics. Of course, is a very very core part of you know what we all do, and even analytics has sort of moved. You know, so it's moved from uh, descriptive analytics in terms of you know I mean just saying what has happened to 
you know, more predictive in terms of, you know, I mean, what should happen. And of course, we are now at a stage, you know, where we use our data and the insights which we have to make it even more prescriptive from our, for our customers. So, you know, and we actually recommend saying that this is what you should do, you know, in terms of whether it's a, it's a product feature or a CX kind of a feature. Yeah. So that's where we are, I mean, at the moment. Um, we now move traditionally again to what is called BPM 4.0, uh, you know, which is, and this uh, this has actually also got, uh, you know, accelerated as part of COVID. And I think the largest piece which comes out, because some of the other stuff uh, we've been doing for a while, but, you know, it's, it's the third pillar there, you know, in terms of business outcomes, yeah. So how do we move from business operations, you know, to sort of influencing business outcomes, yeah. And again, I just correlate to sort of what we do at Connect. So we also have three pillars largely there. We, we believe that we add to our customers' revenues. We sort of help manage customer efficiencies, you know, in terms of some of the back office work which we do. Uh, revenues in terms of, you know, some of the sales processes which we run in terms of, you know, the telesales process, cross-sell, upsell, you know, and we sort of very large, we run a large practice there. And of course, you know, the last bit is enhancing customer experience, yeah. And that's the core which we sort of kind of do. So I think uh, this, is, this is the most important piece of BPM4, where how do we move the contact center from being a cost center to a profit center, yeah. And, 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 and as I said, profit center in terms of the cross sales done. I mean, for example, we, you know, I mean, we sort of contribute for individual names, you know, I mean, cross sales running into three digits, you know, from the kind of telecalling which we do, you know, and this is, of course, both uh, assisted, uh, yeah, assisting the incoming journeys of existing customers as also, you know, cold calling in terms of some of the diesel charges, you know, which our customers can provide. Yeah, and I'm not going to read all of this, but. Um, just like to highlight that we are again getting more and more domain centric. Yeah, I mean, it, so this is really the next stage of the verticalization which started in, in BPM2, where you know we try to believe that you know that I mean we should have leaders, we should have operations uh, heads who you know who understand that business. Yeah. So while yes, uh, BPO is a horizontal, I think it's quite agnostic in terms of you know some of the good things we do. You know some of the efficiency metrics we run. But I think a verticalization flavor or a domain flavor on top uh, definitely adds, uh, adds value to sort of, you know, what, what, we, are, what we work with our customers. Uh, because that domain flavor actually sort of amalgamates, you know, uh, the best practice, the process part, the technology part, you know, and, and gives a bit of an end to end solution. Uh, we are also getting more and more design thinking led. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, looking at things from zero sum, you may call it, uh, you know, I mean, it's an evolution of the zero sum theory which we had where we look. Everything from scratch, uh, everything is up for debate, uh, you know, for, for a fresh look and a fresh pair of eyes. Uh. And last but not the least, you know, I mean, of course, uh, the whole piece which I have mentioned, which also got, has coincided and also got accelerated because of COVID is the whole, uh, you know, the way the workforce, you know, has to get enabled, you know. So the, the kind of skills which we require, you know, for, for the people, um, I was uh, actually uh, uh, speaking at a Genesis event in Bombay yesterday. And you know the point which which I made there also is that you know of course omni-channel you know is the buzzword in terms of the technology part, but that is easier done. But I think the more difficult part of it is you know getting an omni-channel agent. You know you may call it an omni-channel agent or a super agent, because how do how, how do we get someone there you know who can who can uh, converse across customers across channels, you know in a contextual kind of a framework. So so that I believe is a very very important part of you know what we are trying to do in terms of getting the right skilled people, you know, and for that we are trying various options. Yeah? So we are looking at going to tier two, tier three towns because that's where some of the talent could be, uh, we are, you know, we are ensuring we are, wherever possible, we are still running a bit of a hybrid, you know, working model, you know, where 20% of our people are still sort of working from home. Uh, of course, we are also seeing a lot of push on the other side, you know, where many of our customers are now saying that, let's get back to office, yeah. And uh, so it's, it's a mix of both, but yes, I think a hybrid model, in my view, would continue to be there for the foreseeable future. And last but of course, not the least, you know, getting the right skilled people, you know. So, I mean, we run centers of excellence, you know, whether it's for collections. So, yeah, I, I forgot to mention, you know, the Connect is also India's largest professional collections company, yeah. So, we have an integrated model of feed on street and tele collections, you know, where, uh, you know, we can do collections, retail collections largely for the banking and financial services space, yeah. So, we run centers of excellence within Connect. Uh, you know, we run one for sales in terms of how do we uh, get, uh, you know, are, are, are our people trained in sales skills, how do we do refreshers. Uh, and benchmarking is a very, very important component of, you know, whole center of excellence that we run. Yeah? Because 
we ourselves, you know, have you across multiple customers. As I said, we have about 50 plus market units, uh, uh, both domestic and uh, multinational. So how do we sort of, you know, uh, use analytics on top of all the data which we have, you know, and, and try to give insights to our end customers, you know, in terms of improving their collection efficiency or improving their sales conversions. And, then, and that's the important piece. You know, so BPM for now really says, uh, how do we sort of, you know, I mean, contribute to business outcomes, how do we ensure that we have the right people to do that, you know, and in terms of, you know, and then of course, the whole piece of uh, how do we, you know, make uh, more and more, you know, move away from being a you know, cost center to a profit center. Yeah, yeah so what's, what, what's happening in terms of the sort of, you know, some of the major forces impacting businesses globally, yeah, and, and we have touched on more of it, so I'm not really going to talk about uh, all of them. We talked about the workforce, you know, the changes in the workforce space. We talked about the geopolitical environment, you know, of course, uh, uh, the recent ones, you know, particularly the Ukraine-Russia uh, one, you know, I think, I mean, has kept us fairly insulated in the people industry is concerned. But what I will talk about is really, you know, the evolving customer expectations yeah, and how that impacts, you know, the people industry. So what we do see is that, you know, that the, the Gen Z and the millennials, you know, have a significantly higher adoption of digital touch points, you know, in terms of, you know, reaching out to a contact center, uh, you know, than what the earlier Gen X, you know, the boomers did. Yeah. So I think that's a very, very key shift in terms of uh, how our customers then tend to react, you know, so a lot more touch-free options are provided, a lot more self-service, and, and, and as I said, one is of course, you know, the demographic, uh, you know, classifications, the other is of course the kind of products which you do, you know, so for example, typically in a, in a banking kind of environment, I would say, you know, the premium banking, you know, I mean, you better call it priority, privilege, whatever, we also see that those kind of customers, I think, still prefer you know, to make a call or, you know, walk into a branch. Yeah, so uh, the point that I'm making is that, you know, there are, depending on your end customer profile, it really drives in terms of, you know, how do you want to do that. Yeah, but I think, yes, we as an industry, we are very ready to do that. It also sort of reduces your total cost to serve, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, the cost per transaction, you know, when we introduce a lot of sales service, you know, I mean, starting from the very simple IVRs, you know, the more intelligent IVRs, you know, to the AI assisted interactions, you know, which, which now happen. Yeah, so I think that, that's the biggest piece I would like to really highlight to you. You know, other than of course the fact that, you know, technologically we sort of, you know, continue to be sort of, you know, have to be up and, you know, ahead of the curve. And of course, you know, the whole InfoSec compliance, you know, and within technology I'll just sort of highlight that. The whole InfoSec compliance piece has, you know, become even more relevant, you know, particularly, you know, in the, in the work from anywhere kind of environment. You know, which we saw post-COVID, you know, and that's, those are investments, you know, which we as an organization in which we as an industry, you know, continue to make. So, so I mean, I talked about the changing customer expectations in terms of the demographic profile, but, 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 but what are, what are, what are customers saying? You know, so I'm saying, uh, response in real time, yeah, so the ability to decide which channel to sort of, you know, reach out, you know, uh, reach out to a particular, uh, you know, to their customer service, to their service provider, uh, you know, the consistency of the response, yeah, so in terms of, the look and feel of the response, you know, the kind of uh, the detailing of the response. I think there is a high expectation for people to do that. Uh, easy availability of channels, uh, you know, which again uh, you know, goes back to the first point. You know, so if, if it is real time, you know, then of course reaching out, you know, is expected to be more convenient. And then as I said, you know, there is a huge move towards self service, you know, in that sense. In terms of channels, also what we have seen, uh, you know, is that I think nobody writes mails any longer. Yeah, I mean to be honest, yeah, unless of course. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a financial transaction or where you need to look at it. Yeah? So I think mail or you know, snail mail as a sort of channel is definitely sort of coming down in terms of, you know, the sort of uh, uh, the proportion in terms of the volume split. I mean, you know, it's more chat, you know, and of course calling, you know, unlike earlier, you know, and I think a couple of years ago, I mean, there were some of these doom statements saying, you know, that the life of the industry is threatened because, you know, I mean, calling will disappear over a period of time, but I think that's not happened and I always believe that will not happen. Yeah, because particularly in India, you know, I mean, people do have like the comfort of, you know, speaking and, you know, picking up a call and speaking. So, so, so the voice channel continues to remain, you know, a dominant one. So, of course, the, the percentage would, you know, has come down. And then, of course, you have other channels like a WhatsApp, as both for sales and service. We have, and we have chat, you know, so I think those are, you know, the couple of uh, emerging channels which we have. So coming back to, uh, you know, I mean, sort of the theme of what I'm trying to say is how do we move away from, you know, customer service to 
you know, whether you call it customer delight or what we at times internally correct call as customer obsession. Yeah, and, and, and what, what's the difference? Yeah, so I think the key difference really is this whole proactiveness, you know, so customer experience or customer delight or customer obsession is customer service plus plus. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not going to read everything, I'll just, I'll just leave it here for a minute uh, and you can go through. But, I mean, but the key message is that it's more proactive, it's more, uh, uh, more consultative, you know, it also tries to anticipate, you know, the unmet need of customers over and over, you know, the met needs. So that really is sort of you know, what the whole customer delight or customer experience piece is all about. Or you know, other than of course you know, the traditional customer service piece, you know, which we you know, which we have been doing for, for many years. Uh, this really sort of brings everything together on one page in terms of you know, what I've been talking about. So if I sort of gaze into the future, uh, I already talked about or what we are doing or where the industry believes we should be, uh, we should be going the next couple of years. So what is this whole talent piece, you know, which I talked about? So that the talent piece will continue to be very, very important, you know, to win in the you know in the experience economy. Uh, other than that, of course, uh, you know, we in Connect uh, we have actually invested in a, and I'll, I'll come to that a little more in detail. But we are actually investing in building a customer service practice. Yeah. So we want to be a, a consultative customer service uh, practice, irrespective of whether the customer works for us or not. Yeah. So we are going to do it for our existing customers. Um, it's also uh, us going up the value chain in terms of you know what kind of value we will add to our customers. We are we are happy to sort of you know work with people who are not our customers to look at you know their entire customer service landscape. Yeah, so it starts with customer journey mapping. Uh, you know, looking at you know the strategy, working with the customer to sort of define their CX strategy, define their omnichannel strategy. You know, define and integrate their entire technology piece. You know, whether it's as I said, a simple IVR, you know, or the, or the CRM, you know, and we sort of, you know, have capabilities around that. <coughs> and last but not the least, of course, uh, okay. and then, you know, uh, world class operations is a given, yeah? So we could do all of that, but I mean, that would not really help, you know, if we don't have very, very solid underlying <coughs> operations. And, you know, and, and that's what we sort of aim to get. So, so as part of that, you know, I mean, earlier, uh, you know, the idea of, you know, being a re uh, responsive, to a customer was you not know, trying to sort of ensure that we have a scalable model to be let down. Yeah. And, we, and we still do that. Yeah. So, I mean, as I mentioned, we have a large uh, e com play. Yeah. So, we are actually we are getting into the busiest uh, season of the year. You, know? I mean, you would have seen a lot of ads at least other than in the Mumbai papers, I'm sure, here also in terms of all the tenfold events which e commerce companies are launching, whether it's the Big Billion Day or the Great Indian Sale of Amazon. You know? I mean, <coughs> and we work with many of them. So, you know, one, so I think initially it was a view that you know, how can we get, give you on demand ability to ramp up, ramp down, you know, but I think that's one part of it. I think we are now moving to say that how do we bundle the entire customer experience piece as a COE, you know, and I talked about some of the elements of a COE, you know, whether it's in terms of benchmarking or whether it's in terms of, you know, the ROI being a multiple of the cost. So I think that will continue in the future in terms of how do we add value, you know, how do we sort of give back, you know, a multiple of, you know, the cost which an organization. You know, I mean, invest in us. Um, analytics, as I mentioned again briefly, you know, will continue to be an important part of the journey because we have a lot of customer data. Yeah, and, uh, and I'm not going to get there. You know, with the kind of, you know, we may be sort of handing, you know, a couple of uh, single-digit crore kind of calls a year. You know, uh, back office transactions, uh, mail transactions. So how do we mine all that data? How do we sort of get sense out of the data? You know, and then give it back in terms of uh, very relevant customer insights. You know, many of our customers, you know, and as, and as, as, as I think somebody had said, data is a new oil. So, you know, how do we, how do we use data to sort of you know, get customer insights, you know, and add business value and business revenue and outcomes. And last but not the least, of course, AI will continue to play a very, very big part in terms of what we are trying to do, you know, in terms of, uh, as I said, whether it's assisted bots, uh, helping customers complete their, uh, you know, uh, broken journeys, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, for the on the back end side, you know, so whether how we run operations, you know, so for example, whether we use speech analytics, you know, to look at, you know, I mean, uh, giving uh, quality feedback back, you know, to our agents. So how do we look at the whole automating the whole quality feedback piece or or the double effort piece in terms of you know rostering or scheduling? So that's of course would continue, you know, at the back end, you know, for, for any kind of you know, uh, leading BPO, and then of course on the front end, you know, it's really sort of how do we work with our customers to to enable. Yeah. <laughs> on the top CX trend I've talked about, you know, so 
personalization, you know, and people uh, want to sort of, you know, I mean, have that flexibility to sort of reach out, you know, to the organization depending on what channel they want and when they reach out, they expect that, you know, we should have had a sense of all the, you know, prior interactions, you know, which could have happened as they on the previous 48 hours, you know, whether someone has written a mail, someone has had a chat, someone has made a call, you know, so bringing it all up together, you know, so that, you know, when the fresh interaction happens, you know, the huge focus is on getting it right the first time, you know, so whether we call it FTR or or you know, FCR. I mean, I think that's the ultimate goal, you know, which I think Connect and everybody is working towards, you know, that how do we get that uh, seamless uh, customer to customer experience. Yeah, so this is this is the framework which we use, you know, sort of when we work with our customers, and I'll spend a minute here talking about uh, not only customer experience, but I think employee experience, you know? uh, because employee experience in, in our view is equally important, if not more so, you know, than customer experience. And we believe that employee experience is an integral part of the whole customer experience framework. Because only if you have happy employees, you know, you could sort of have that translated into a happy customer, you know, in terms of the any customer experience that person can provide. So we have also looked at our entire uh, end to end uh, you know, employee life cycle journey with us, right from hiring and onboarding, you know, <laughs> to investments in L and So we run programs, you know, where we take our uh, you know, people, enable our people to get promoted to the next level. Yeah, we call it Super Thirty Two. Uh, you know, in terms of, uh, and, it, and, it, and it's come from, you know, one of the IIT trainings, you know, which I think there was a movie also a couple of years ago, where we actually sort of ensure that, you know, our, uh, our team members are, are, you know, get the right level of coaching, you know, post spending certain time in the organization. So we believe that we try to make all our, uh, all our leadership roles, you know, starting from TLs and above as much as possible internally, rather than going to the market. Yeah. So we enable our people to get promoted, to grow. Of course, comp and is an important part of it. It's a whole culture, a whole culture piece which we drive it. And of course, exit experience, yeah? because at times organizations don't, uh, you know, I mean, don't give equal importance to the exit experience, yeah? whether it's a full final settlement or you know, getting you know, releasing letters and all of that. And you know, at times, you know, of course, you know, it comes out on social media in terms of class law and some of the other uh, uh, other challenges are there. So there's a whole employee experience. So, Customer experience, of course, the, the most important part I talk about is the NBS. Yeah? So we ensure you know, that our customers, uh, we work with our customers in, in developing NPS frameworks. Uh, how do we how do we measure? How do we how often do we report? And of course, the end goal being you know that we continue to increase the uh, number of promoters, reduce the detractors, you know, and, and also sort of move the passive lot to the to the promoter lot. Uh, the other bit is the customer effort score, yeah? so I mean, uh, I think a lot of companies don't track that, but we also sort of encourage our customers to track that. You know, which really talks about how difficult or easy it is, you know, for, you know, for a person, person to sort of deal with an organization, yeah. We ourselves do that with our own customers, yeah, so we also, you know, on an annual basis, run an NPS survey for our customers, you know, and we track both, we track NPS and we track effort score, in terms of how easy it is to sort of, you know, do business with us as an organization, so we also actually do that. Uh, quality is an important part of the customer experience. And what we are also trying to now do is link quality to the NPS. Because otherwise in the past, you know, we have seen these sort of, you know, being done in silos. Yeah, so sometimes, you know, you may have a quality score of 90%, but your NPS will still be, you know, within 30. I mean, I'm just, I'm just quoting some numbers. Yeah, because what happens is that we measure different things. Yeah, so in the quality piece, we may measure in terms of, you know, how that person has, you know, responded, what are the soft skills, you know, whether, you know, I mean, any kind of mis-selling has happened, you know, but NPS is slightly different, you know, when the customer is the promoter or not, and that largely depends on whether you have solved the customer's problem or not, yeah. So we are also, you know, looking at the journey to sort of link quality to NPS, yeah, because in, in my mind, there should be a linkage, it has happened over a period of time, but a high quality score, sorry, a high, sorry, a high quality call should be able to sort of generate a high NPS for the end customer, you know, and the NPS is the process of doing that. Uh, on the digital experience, of course, as I said, omnichannel is a given, you know, I mean, that has sort of uh, accelerated over the last six to seven years in terms of how do we do that. Personalization is an important piece, a lot of customers expect personalization in terms of whether it's the offers made to them, you know, or of course, you know, the very basic, as I said, uh, you know, contextual response, you know, which is expected in the cost center. And then finally, of course, you know, I mean, all of this, if you do, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean you know, it does lead to a differentiated brand experience. You know, which is the outcome, you know, which sort of all organizations want in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, what kind of feedback do we give back to our customers, you know, which then ensures that they can continue to work on the product side, they can continue to work on the branding and marketing side, you know, with a view to sort of, you know, give the entire owner, entire brand, and customer experience to the customer. 
Uh, this is a busy slide, uh, but this really sort of talks about you know the customer uh, CX uh, COE, which we are sort of building and running within Connect, and you know working with our customers. And of course, it has got three pillars: it's got process, it's got operations, and it's got technology. Yeah, so we work with partners in terms of you know, providing technology solutions, um, you know, to our uh, you know to our customers. Uh, as I said, starting with uh, you know mapping the customer journey, so you know doing a sort of discovery process through you know a series of workshops and brainstorming with our customers, then helping them sort of through the entire CX design in terms of channels, in terms of locations, in terms of how do we cater to some of the language mixes. What is that current baseline? You know? So there's an important element of baselining which we do with the CX design part of it, and you know, and then how do we sort of set targets for ourselves to sort of move some of you know some of those metrics from where they are to where you know we want to be. Then of course comes the delivery part of it, you know, in terms of the whole omni-channel orchestration, uh, the analytics piece I talked about, uh, the contact center as a service, you know, which we sort of you know, try to make it more and more. Uh, uh, OPEX based, you know, rather than expecting the customer to make a significant uh, capex investment up front. And then at the end of it, the whole quality assurance piece, you know, that how do we ensure that all of this is coming together, you know, and as I said, lead <coughs> to customer outcomes rather than, you know, a static measurement of, of all quality. And then, of course, all of this we believe, you know, works as a positive uh, feedback loop and a positive loop, you know, to sort of get the end customer delight, uh, you know, which we want to do. And you know, we learn across across the various businesses we run. We share best practices across. Yeah, so our leaders share best best practices for CX, uh, you know, or even operational metrics, which is a given. And finally, of course, what are the benefits of the customers? So, you know, first call resolution, higher first call resolution, lower uh, TCO, uh, improved CSAT, NPS, uh, lower customer effort, higher revenues. You know, as as I said, either in terms of cross sell, upsell. Or in terms of you know moving that loyalty portion up, you know, which gets the repeat purchase. Uh, you know, improvement of course in the service metrics and uh, as I said, overall end goal being uh, improvement, significant improvement in the brand view. And of course, you know, I mean, uh, uh, customer service is at the heart of everything we do. As I said, we, I mean, I mean, our, I mean, customer CX, CX is one of our largest uh, verticals, and you know, we sort of build some of the other stuff around it. Yeah, so delivery excellence, of course, is at the heart of it, as I mentioned. You cannot build a center of excellence without delivery excellence. And then, how do we add the pieces on top of it in terms of digitalization, uh, digital transformation, you know, and then, you know, moving CX from, you know, just being customer service to customer experience or customer obsession, if possible. Employee experience, as I mentioned, is an integral part of CX. So, you know, various employee engagement tools which we have in terms of, you know, I mean, the starting night for production to sort of, you know, recognizing people who cover 101 days with us, you know, because we also see that there is a lot of infant mortality, if I can use the word, in terms of, you know, attrition in the first 90 days. So we actually do, uh, you know, I mean, we actually have a graduation ceremony and we call it the 101 uh, retention program, you know, we give them certificates for those who cover 100 days with us. So we have, of course, the strong regulatory governance which we have in terms of, you know, and of course, some of this is uh, statutory also in terms of you know, some of the posh committees. We have an ethics and whistleblower committee. Sorry, ethics committee and a whistleblower uh, you know, I mean, email ID so that people can reach out to. We have something called I feel, you know, which is uh, which helps us track real time uh, employee mood. Yeah. So uh, when a person logs in, uh, you know, the person there, there are three. I mean, there is a smiley, there is a sort of you know, intermediate account. So that person can actually sort of you know say that how that person is feeling that day. And then that data gets pulled up by the PL, you know, to sort of see what is happening, you know, what is behind the problem, you know, what, what we can do. Uh, on the other side, we also have something called a lag status, you know, where the PL has to sort of fill up, uh, you know, in terms of what the uh, employees perceive status is, you know, whether it is red, amber, or green, as far as the pressure risk is concerned, yeah. So when we marry both this data, you know, do some analytics over it, it helps us, you know, reduce some of the uh, attrition trends which we see, and, you know, we run one of the uh, best uh, attrition rates in the domestic uh, micro industry. Other than that, of course, you know, some wellness programs, uh, hobby jobs, you know, but I think it's just, it should not be uh, given. Right? Uh, career development, I talked about, so we run what is called the Connect Academy. So, you know, some milestone programs, you know, as, as people go into leadership roles, uh, senior leadership programs, and we ensure that we enable people yeah, to be able to go in there, yeah, rather than <coughs> just giving an opportunity. Yeah, so, as I said, we run a SCP Academy. 
for CX particularly. So, you know, we do a couple of milestones in the first 90 days, and then 90 days and above, you know, where we, you know, where we give refreshers, we certify people, we give them a sales uh, training, we give a certificate to say that, you know, that they are a certified uh, sales trainer, sales professional. It sort of helps them internally also, and of course, adds a uh, hopefully some value to the whole of their And of course, we are a great place to work certified, so uh, <coughs> we started being certified years ago, last year we were at, uh, at 92, we were in the top 100, this year we were at, uh, at 41, yeah. so we were in the top 50 this year, and yeah, I mean, without, uh, without sounding immodest, I think the good part is that, you know, we were significantly better than, you know, many of the international PBOs which are there in the country, but in fact, you know, the professional services were there. Yeah. Can I ask a question on that? Yes. Yeah. So, is this program being running over the past four months? Yes. No, we, no, as I said, it's a three-year journey. Uh, so we got, we got certified. So we just got certified in 2020. Yes, yes. Yeah. Then last year we were in the top 100 at rank uh, 92. Yeah. And this year we were at, sorry, rank 91. And this year we were at rank 42 in the top 50. Yeah, so some of this we believe, of course, has gone into this because I think very, many transparent I think in the domestic industry, our compensation philosophy is a P50 to P75. Yeah, so we are definitely not the highest uh, pay masters in the country. Yeah. <coughs> but how do we give up people and how do we look at the non-financial part of it, you know, in terms of career development, in terms of just treating them well. So I think, I mean, we are very, very proud to say that even during COVID, you know, where large parts of our business just shut down overnight, particularly in the hospitality side, you know, where, you know, certain customers have 300 people, you know, they give a notice and say, we want to be 20% coming on. Yeah. But we have paid everybody. Yeah. So we did not hold salaries for anybody who actually worked with us through that period. And particularly at the age of yeah. So uh, April, May, June 20, we not only paid them in full, we paid them on time. So not a day's delay in terms of, you know, during the COVID period. Yes, of course, us seniors, you know, took some salary cuts for a pay that, you know, that of course we sort of need, you know, got that got it back and realized. But we believe that some of the stuff which we do in terms of, and I think the largest word I've used is empathy. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we treat our employees? I think empathy is the largest thing which we do in terms of, you know, ensuring that, you know, when they are here, they feel respected. You know, they feel this thing, but because as I said, uh, we are not the best paymaster, but we have to sort of compensate and build a whole employee value proposition, you know, around the fact, you know, that yes, we may not be the best paymaster, but there are maybe 10 other things we do, you know, which hopefully makes them try with us. Better. So it's going to be like top 20 next year. <coughs> so that's the intent, yeah, we have to see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think, of course, as we go, it starts getting more and more difficult. But I think, to be very honest with you, I think us getting a top 50 year also doesn't really surprise. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because you really can't plan these things. Yeah. Because you don't know what others have done, you know, because again, this is a bit of a benchmarking kind of thing, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, that was not the intention. Yes, I think we have continued to focus. And yes, we were pleasantly surprised with us. So, let's see, you know, to wait and see, you know, where we land. Oh, another question. Yes, please. Uh, you want me to get back? No, no, that's okay. I think it's absolutely great what you presented. Everything is well, uh, fine. But what are the top two or three things that you see? Uh, which differentiates you from other competition similar to you? What, what, what do you think you, you're doing uniquely or differently as compared to your competitor which will help you in the long run? So, so I think we do two or three things uh, slightly differently. So I think again, this whole empathy piece, we, you know, we sort of practice with our customers also. Yeah. So, uh, you know, yes, and, 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 I, and I don't want to be uh, incorrectly quoted, yes, we all have contracts, you know, and we all sort of have yeah. commercial uh, you know, I mean, our commercials and our existence as an organization depends on how, uh, you know, how sharply we emphasize contracts, right? But, but they are flexible, uh, I would say, yeah. So, when another again, take a COVID example. Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when somebody goes out of the contract and says that, you know, that he wants to go from 300 to 20 in one month. You know, our contracts typically will say that every month you can reduce 10%, 15%, you know, which we can then manage, you know. Now, we have, we have accommodated that, you know. So we have had very robust conversations with customers during the COVID period also, you know, when we have requested some customers to support us with salary. I mean, I'll just give you an example, you know, to say that, okay, fair enough, we support you, we'll, we'll run them down, but please help them only with the salary. That's it. The, 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 the FT cost was 100 rupees. You know, we would say, please pay a salary with this, it's really 60 or 2 of, 60 percent or 2 cut of, you know, our cost base. So we work very closely with our customers to see, how do we sort of you know, get them to believe that we are true partners? I think that is one thing which we do. The other thing I think which we do quite well is this whole value add piece. And I'm not saying that others don't do it. 
Yeah, but as I said, the sales part of it, you know, so we are really focused over the last couple of years in making investments into our sales capability. So as I said, you know, if, if somebody is spending 100 rupees with us in terms of the monthly billing, maybe the value that the bank gets is maybe maybe 10x, 15x in terms of just the cross sell which you do. Yeah. And as I said, the cross sell which you do sometimes are in excess of three digits in terms of the loans dispersed, you know, the, the card issued or whatever. Yeah, and of course we don't get to see the end-to-end -end value chain of that in terms of what is the value of that, but at least the numbers are large in terms of I mean health dispersing total cost of personal loan. Yeah. <coughs> Tools and technologies that you use internally, you can use that as a sales tool to sell it to your customers. Do you think that's something which would impact your yes, so sales? Example, so the way we look at technologies, we, have, we work with partners. We have certain proprietary technologies. Uh, you know, so for example, on the collection side, we have a tool called ED Collect. Yeah, which is of course, you know, and again, as I'm saying that, yes, it has got some unique features, but I think, again, that is pretty standard in the market in terms of a touch-free collection tool, you know, where some of the early bucket collection you know, are sort of a pass through that and an omni channel kind of environment. So, so those are tools we are happy to sort of, you know, in that we part it, we do it as part of our solution. But we also have examples, you know, where not only so, so for example, if you are doing say fifty percent of the collections volunteer to bring a customer, and that tool is the bank or the NBFC uses for the entire base. So even for them, you know, for the balance fifty percent, where we may not be doing the service part of it, you know, but we have actually helped to sell that product. You know, and then get there. So yes, I think we believe some of the tools and technologies which we have does help in terms of you know, I mean, their end customer experience or their because see, collections is very very uh, a direct impact in the bottom line. Yeah, so particularly if it's a return of pool, there's definitely direct impact. If it's early buckets, whatever you collect, it helps when it doesn't go into the next more difficult bucket. So yes, it definitely adds value. <coughs> so I think it's that empathy. It's you know, some of these COs which we have built. In collections and sales, you know, I think we sort of add the value to our end. Uh, this is just a couple of case studies, uh, you know, which is sort of which we have helped. Uh, so, you know, whether it's as I said, uh, some of the more uh, uh, service kind of metrics in terms of PhDs, uh, CSATs, uh, DATs, uh, or you know, we have also talked about. Some of the sales value adds we have added, uh, or you know, I mean, how we have sort of helped reduce TCO, you know, by reducing the uh, FTEs, you know, as you know, looking at the same kind of volumes getting uh, answered or complicated. Uh, yeah, I've talked about it. So we are India, one of India's largest TCOs, 45,000 plus, uh, significant client retention rates. So we will take pride that I mean, we needed about 90 percent of our customers. You know? I mean, so we don't let customers. Yes, there are certain challenges which we sometimes see, particularly on the government side, you know, where largely we see more and more contracts on an N1 basis. Uh, where we sort of, you know, I mean, we, I mean uh, being the largest, you know, and being completely compliant on statutory norms and all, we are, yes, we are marginally more expensive. We have also seen a lot of smaller BPOs coming in the three or last couple of years. And, and that's why we can't, we can't reason with our price, but other than that, I think uh, nobody has sort of let us go because of the fact that we didn't deliver value. The significant uh, you know, language capability which we have, uh, constantly covered by you know some of your, uh, you know the Kafkas and Nelsons of the world in terms of you know, I mean uh, the ratings which we get, and of course we've been going at a very very fast pace for the last many many years. We've been in business for about 18 years now, and uh, very very focused on the domestic space. Unlike other, unlike some of our other competition. Who, depending on you know who the ultimate uh, shareholder is, you know have you know gone into domestic, gone out again, gone into domestic. But I think we are very very focused on on domestic. Uh, we have also uh, just uh, just to sort of add, uh, we have incubated a technology services piece uh, in the last year, where we believe that you know we have a lot of customer data. You know we are, we run customer operations. Yeah. So how do we sort of also help them manage some of their technology based around it? Yeah. Uh, so it's a nascent business to be honest, but we are, um, you know, we are incubating six six uh, centers of excellence, or you know, six COEs again on the technology side, you know, where uh, we can help you with cyber security, we can help you with uh, full stack development or low code, no code. We can we can help you with user testing, you know, which is one of the verticals which we have. Uh, of course, RPI is a integral part of sort of what we do. Uh, we are also partners now, you know, for many of the CRM. Implementation companies, you know, so they are partners with the UI part on the on the, on the AI side with ServiceNow, uh, you know, with uh, on your you know 
on this on the CRM side or the workflow management side. So, so we are doing all of that, uh, including you know enabling you know, cloud enablement, you know app development, all of that. So so that's that's an additional piece which we have sort of incubated over the last eighteen months, and we are uh, we are getting there. I mean it's a, it's a niche business, but we believe that over a period of time, you know our digital footprint or our digital IT footprint, you know would start producing increasing part of the connectivity as we well go forward and complement the PPS. So this really talks about what I just mentioned, I don't want to repeat it, but you know, and we work with partners uh, <coughs> across the board in terms of your know, setting that you do. Yeah, thank you. So so I'm I'm sorry if I'm I don't really get uh, track of the time. I did not have a prompter also to help me with that, but uh, I hope uh, the time has been useful and, and happy to take it. Thank you, sir.